Everyone, we'll give it just a minute as folks roll in. Good morning, everyone. We'll give it just a minute here as folks roll in. All right, it's 10 one we'll go ahead and get started. Um, a few folks might trickle in, but I wanna make a good use of everyone's time. I'm Jeremy Rogers, the Director of Legal Affairs at Oregon Realtors, and was one of the attorneys that worked on drafting the Oregon Realtors forms. Today, we wanna talk about our uh, seller occupancy agreement. Uh, this is the agreement that is used uh, when a seller is going to remain after closing. And I know that this is uh, likely gonna be a very commonly used document um, and one that we're really proud of. We really like what we've put together and hopefully uh, you'll find it very helpful for you and your clients. And we look forward to talking about it today. Before we pull up the document and review that though, I um, just wanted to uh, give a quick uh, reminder uh, of some of the resources that are available to everybody. Uh, who's using the forms on our website. And the uh, URL for that is orforms.org. And we have a training tab here that uh, includes many options for you to get training in addition to these weekly 10 a.m. live trainings and webinars, which you can find here at this green button. We have a whole slew of self-paced trainings, including all of the previously recorded live trainings. Um, are in the self-paced training library for you to take on your own time if you missed them originally. Um, and uh, those are available for CE credit. We have our virtual open house, which takes place at 11 o'clock on Friday. So it'll happen right after this meeting. <clears throat> and then, um, and that's an opportunity for you to just ask general questions to one of the attorneys that drafted the forum. So um, anything that comes up during the week on your transactions and you kind of got a question about, you know, the use of a particular form, pop in there. You can stay for a couple minutes and ask a question. You can stick around for longer. We encourage you to take, you know, make use of that. And then we have some recorded tutorials, which will uh, be shorter, typically shorter videos, not long enough for CE credit, but um, lots of good topic specific items in there that could be helpful to you in learning different aspects of the form. So I encourage you to check that out. Uh, we also have been expanding upon our annotated forms library. So this here is the uh, annotated forms library called the guided forms library. And uh, each of the forms here that has a green button that says guided forms with videos, that means that there is a version of the form that uh, has little video icons next to each provision. And uh, you can use that to explain the provisions of the form to you. I'm looking here to see, yeah, so 2.16, the form we're talking about today, the seller occupancy agreement, there's a guided form with video. So if you click on this, um, you'll see that there's these little video icons. You click on those and um, Nicholas Peasley, our staff attorney provides a video explanation of that section. So um, if there's something that <clears throat> you wanna revisit after today's presentation, this guided form will be a good tool for you to use. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is that we have and uh, this is going to be a good test for me here because I am not sure where it is on the site. Um, let's see if it's here. Um, hopefully you've all been receiving our weekly forms tips. We've actually created a um, page on our site now for the weekly forms tips. So uh, we're archiving all of those. So you'll be able to go back and review all of those tips. Oh, there it is, there we put it. Check out the tip of the week. Um, so we're gonna continue to every Friday, send out a forms newsletter. Uh, in that newsletter, we will provide a tip on using a particular form or you know an issue related to forms. And we will also uh, be spotlighting one of our guided forms. And now you have a place where you can go back and uh, 
find that information and use that as a resource. And over time, this would become quite, I think, a helpful uh, tool for you to quickly find uh, information that is helpful to you. So with that, let's go ahead and take a look at our seller occupancy agreement. And I really do encourage you to ask me questions as we go. I want to make sure as we walk through this um, that you understand each section of the document and uh, sort of why we did what we did. And if you have any questions or anything's unclear or ambiguous to you, just uh, let us know and, and, and we'll go ahead and answer those. So, um, of course, we start our agreements, all of them with property address or description, sale agreement number here up top names of the parties for buyer for sellers if you don't have four no big deal um, this first section of substance here section three is orienting people to this form and helping to explain uh, the purpose which is for the seller occupying after title has transferred um, for a period lasting no more than 90 calendar days and the reason for that 90 calendar day uh, provision is because if you go over 90 calendar days, then you are squarely within the Oregon Landlord Tenant Act, and you have to comply with all of the various and detailed attendant uh, statutory provisions of that act. And that is not what is intended with these agreements. If you uh, want to do something for longer than 90 days, you really need to be using a lease agreement and your client needs to understand that they are becoming a true landlord. It's not just a agreement to occupy after closing and they need to seek appropriate advice um, on what that means to be a landlord. We don't want people to um, sort of be accidentally falling into uh, landlord status when that's not the intent. And just so you understand where that comes from. And uh, this was before my time, but what I imagine here was that uh, that uh, some very good lobbying by your realtor association is what accomplished this exclusion that's in Oregon statute, uh, ORS 90.110. And what we're looking at here is num uh, sub subsection two. Okay? And that describes that occupancy of a dwelling unit for no more than 90 days by a purchaser prior to the scheduled closing or a seller following the closing uh, is permitted. Um, without creating a landlord and tenant relationship, but still giving uh, the uh, person who um, <clears throat> owns the property the opportunity to evict, okay? <clears throat> so what we have is <clears throat> the benefit of not being a landlord um, and being able to really define the terms in the contract rather than having to worry about all the statutory requirements of a landlord, but also the benefit um uh to use the eviction process to get the person out if they in fact are violating this occupancy agreement okay so it's a really kind of a nice thing for this particular situation and as i mentioned likely resulted from effective lobbying by uh oregon realtors um so that's what the purpose is uh this next section we really put a lot of thought into uh, how to set up this occupancy terms section so that it really dealt with uh, appropriately the situations that are likely to arise. Um, and we tried to use a lot of checkbox and fill in options to make it flexible enough for the parties uh, to define the terms of the, rela the, the relationship. So there's options here to, for the entire property, uh, which is most common. Okay, but um, if it's a large property, perhaps with multiple dwelling units on it, then uh, perhaps it's only a portion of the property that's going to be occupied. So we provide the check boxes and the ability to describe that portion of the property. Uh, we also provide some flexibility here on how you define the term. Okay, so you can use a particular date. Okay, uh, 5 p.m. is the default, but you can write one in for time. And then you also could use calendar days after closing. Okay. Now we use calendar days because that's what makes sense here rather than business days, given that we're talking about an occupancy that's likely to last, you know, for at least a couple of weeks. And so you can choose the number of days after closing if that um, is, is uh, the way that the folks want to go. Um, now we put this provision in to create sort of an automatic 
fail safe so that there is not an unintentional landlord tenant relationship that's created this line 20 and 21 here. We say that the seller's right to occupy will automatically terminate at the end of the term above or at the end of 90 calendar days, whichever is sooner. Okay. So don't ever write this thing for longer than 90 calendar days. But if that was done unintentionally, we do have this provision here, which is sort of a savings clause. Um, uh, the right of the seller to be occupying the home. I see there's a key question. I'll get that in a second. The right of the seller to occupy the property is, um, is going to be exclusive unless otherwise indicated. Okay. I mean, so they would have the, uh, what would typically be the benefits of a tenant of exclusive, uh, um, uh, control of the property for the purposes of, of residing there. Uh, but, and also, um, though for residential use, okay, not for any other type of use, not to run a business out of it unless parties have agreed to that. And then we also, um, rather than sort of requiring the parties to write in that it was okay to allow pets, we set this up so that any pets currently living on the property automatically are going to be able, you know, be allowed, okay, because the seller is living there, they already have their pets. They're essentially just extending that period of time that they're living there. We didn't want the parties to have to proactively say that, um, you know, pet, the particular pet is allowed, which is how some other agreements work on this uh, topic. We also uh, say that it cannot be sublet, uh, but we do provide this exception space, okay? So the parties can define terms that are different than what we have here. We provided space for that <clears throat> but you can see here what the defaults are. I'm gonna get to that question now. You still have an eviction notice or is in place of that for any occupants who still want to stay. Do you still have to give an eviction notice or is this in place of that for any occupants still want to stay? Okay, Gail, um, if I don't um, answer your question, let me know because I'm, I'm not sure I fully understand, but the <clears throat> we'll get to the provision later about eviction there's going to be a 24 hour notice that's required. Okay. But because you're not operating under the Oregon residential landlord tenant act, all of the details of what's required for a notice under that act are not going to apply. Okay. So you don't have such a strict interpretation of the proper way to give the notice, but uh, you still do need to give at least 24 hours notice. And that is in the contract later. So again, I'm not sure if I answered that. If not, feel free to um, ask an additional question. So then we also try to create some flexibility on the payment terms. And we know that parties have different ways they like to define that for these types of occupancy agreements. So, um, you know, a simple approach is to just have a total amount. Okay, and so that's the first option we provide with a checkbox, write in the total amount. Uh, for uh, the entire occupancy term. You also could do that as an amount per day, but even if you do it as an amount per day, uh, you need to calculate the total amount. Okay? In part, that's because this next line here, we say, unless otherwise agreed in a general addendum, the seller is gonna be paying the buyer the total amount through escrow. Okay? So we wanna know what the total amount is. We don't want there to be confusion about that in the contract. If you just did a daily amount, we want it to be a fixed amount. Okay, I see there's a chat. Um, if tenant is occupied by tenant, will the same form apply? If tenant is occupied by tenant, will the same form apply? Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand that question if you wanna clarify. Um, okay, if the home is occupied by tenant, will the same form apply? Um, well, if you were, so, and I don't know if anyone's taken our classes on tenant occupied properties, but we have separate forms that, because if there's a tenant, then the landlord tenant act is going to apply. Okay. And the buyer, when they take title to the property is going to be the new landlord. Okay. Even if they never entered into a lease agreement with that tenant. And so that tenant still has all the rights that they had with respect to the tenancy that they had previously. So we have a separate document, the form 7.1, which is the uh, tenant occupancy um, or the tenant vacancy addendum, 
which deals with all of the issues around a buyer who is purchasing a home, not as an investment property, but for themselves to move in, but there is a tenant in there. And in some cases, depending on how you fill that form out, you're gonna require that the tenant be, be gone before closing, or in other circumstances, you can fill out that form to allow the tenant to remain. In either event, you're not gonna be using this form. If you allowed the tenant to remain, they would, you'd be the landlord, they'd be the tenant, and you'd need to follow ORS chapter 90 and the appropriate protocols for issuing notice <clears throat> to the tenant under that statute. Um, all right, security deposits. Uh, so that's the next section. Uh, you don't have to do a security deposit, okay? And we do know that there's a lot of differing opinions among our members about the appropriateness or the appropriate level of security deposit for these rent back agreements. So we gave you a lot of options. Okay, you don't have to do it. You can say no, not obligated. Uh, $1,000 is kind of the pre-printed number that we've put here. Um, uh, if you want to go with that option as a default or uh, choose your own adventure, you know, pick an amount for the uh, deposit that you would like and enter it here and check this box. So. Uh, we say that that will be to, uh, through escrow, okay? Um, and then escrow will give it to the buyer at closing. And then there's going to be provisions under which that we're going to talk about here, governing sort of what the buyer can and cannot do with that deposit. Okay? One of the things that we say here up front, because we're not under the Landlord Tenant Act, we can define our own rules around deposits. Um, and also because you're not, no one's being a property manager here, okay? All of the rules that you may be familiar with related to client trust accounts and all of that for property management, those aren't gonna apply here either. So we just wanna make it clear that it's the terms of this contract that are gov governing how the security deposit is dealt with, not the things that you may be familiar with for landlords and tenants under ORS chapter 90 or for property managers under the Oregon Real Estate Agency laws and regulations. Um, so then uh, we are requiring that seller provide buyer with the contact information so that that security deposit can be returned directly. Okay, also so that there can be contact. We'll talk about this later, but we have a provision later in the document that says, hey, after closing, the real estate agents have nothing to do with this anymore. Okay, this is buyer and seller and all communication and, you know, any issues that come up are going to be dealt with directly through buyer and seller. We really want to remove the real estate agent from that relationship or a reliance on it because you're not a property manager. That's not your, your role. You sold the house to them uh, or, you know, you sold the house. The parties agreed that they were willing to let each other live there. Uh, the other party lived there, but, you know, we don't want you having to get in between uh, and play the role of property manager when that's not you know really the role that you signed up for uh okay good okay good glad people like that um so uh then what we say in terms of the provisions of refunding the security deposit okay we give some options so five business days is pre-printed you can pick your own as well um, and that would be after the end of the occupancy term, unless the seller has breached a material term of this agreement. Now, this is a good opportunity to also tell you, and there's a provision later that describes this. Uh, this document, this agreement is not governed by the notice of default rules that apply in our sale agreement and in most of our other addenda. So for those who've been using our documents or who've taken our training on terminations and defaults, uh, you know that we use a notice of default typically to notify the other party that they are not complying with the term of the contract and giving them a period of time to correct that uh, and get the contract back on track. Or if they don't correct it, um, for the other party to terminate okay, and be able to have a right to earnest money. So that's how that works for most all of our other documents and the base sale agreement does not apply here. Okay, um, We're back kind of in standard contract law breach um, here where we're not, and we're not saying that you need to send that notice of default because um, <clears throat> that is really for the sale agreement and things that happened before closing. Uh, so we'll talk more about that in a bit. 
but if seller has breached a, a, a material term of the agreement, then the buyer does have a right under this contract to retain a portion of that security deposit. And they have that right based upon um, damages that are suffered by the buyer, any reasonable costs incurred or expected to be incurred by the buyer due to the seller's breach of the agreement. And that would include um, costs of bringing the property into the condition that is required under this agreement. And really that's the same standard as it was at closing. Okay, the buyer has to, the seller's got to deliver the property to the buyer in the condition that it was in when buyer made their offer to purchase. Okay, so we're, we're carrying that requirement forward into the occupancy agreement. And so anything that would need to be done to get it back in that condition, that would be a, a reasonable use of the security deposit funds, okay, if the seller violated this agreement by getting the property out of that condition. Um, reasonable attorney's fees, costs, and expenses that are occurred in pursuing an eviction or otherwise enforcing this agreement, those are also acceptable costs uh, to be used by buyer out of the security deposit. Um, and again, we said we're defining the terms here. So there may be things in landlord tenant law that you can or cannot use a security deposit for. We don't have to worry about those because we're not being governed by landlord tenant law. Um, and so in thinking about whether you, you're in your client thinking about whether they want to do a security deposit and how much it's important for them to read this section of the contract and understand what it could be used for. And also think ahead to things like attorney's fees and costs, uh, because they may not be thinking about that. They might be saying, well, okay, you know, if they stain the carpet, I could keep some security deposit. But here also, you know, if you need to bring an attorney in uh, to pursue a damage claim or to pursue an eviction, you could use it to cover those costs. So you, they might want to consider including a security deposit and uh, including it at a significant enough amount that to actually help them with those expenses should they be incurred. Um, so I know, I know some people really don't like to do the security deposit with these agreements, but it's there for a reason and it really can protect the buyer. So it's important, I think, at least for the buyer to review these provisions and 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 think through that and make sure that they know what they're giving up if they're not requiring a security deposit. Uh, I see a Q&A. What happens if there's a dispute regarding the deposit and damage has occurred and seller says that it was the way it was and there aren't any damage. Yeah, so anytime there's gonna be a dispute over damages, then uh, you know we can't prevent that, right? So here, the way that would work is the buyer would keep the security deposit and they would then account for how it was spent. And we'll talk about that here, um, how they would do that. And then if there's a dispute, then the seller would uh, you know, bring an action against the buyer to try to resolve that dispute. Uh, and we say in this agreement that other than eviction, which obviously goes through eviction through the, the circuit court, other than eviction, the dispute resolution provisions of the sale agreement also apply here. Okay, so if it was less than $10,000, which it probably would be, it's going to be a small claims that the seller is going to bring that, hey, the buyer wrongfully kept my security deposit because the home was in fact in the condition that it was supposed to be in and the buyer was wrong about uh, taking that deposit okay but they would just have to pursue that through the dispute resolution if it was more than ten thousand it would go to uh, mediation and then if unresolved the mediation to arbitration unfortunately there's nothing we can really do in a contract to prevent factual disputes like that those just have to be hashed out in a, in a court of law or through a mediation and arbitration process uh, but here's what the buyer needs to do if they are going to keep a portion of that deposit. Okay, so within 10 or blank, you know, put in your own number of business days after a buyer does retain the deposit, okay, then they have to provide a written explanation of what seller's breach was and what those damages suffered by buyer were, along with supporting evidence. Okay, so in that case, buyer's going to have have prepared and produced that, that's going to give seller then a good idea if, in your, to your question, you know, if they disagree, um, then, you know, there's already going to be, you're sort of already down the road on that process of each side sort of preparing some evidence about that. So here, buyer would need to provide that itemized list of repairs and expenses that by their either, either, either has incurred or is expected to incur, including any written receipts or estimates 
Okay. You know, and so, and it needs to be supported by that. So if they're going to, if they've already done the repair, it's receipts. If they are expecting to incur it, then you, you're going to, they're going to need to include estimates. Okay. For those expected expenses. And that's why we give 10 business days or however many you want to put in it, give some time for the buyer to be able to do that. Um, and then the balance of any remaining security deposit funds. So if they have evidence to show that they need to keep $500, but it was a thousand dollar deposit, they need to then, you know, within this 10 business day period or whatever period you select, provide the addition, the 500 remaining along with the written explanation and the evidence here. Um, so we don't have a form for providing the written explanation and evidence. And frankly, you all aren't gonna be involved at that point, okay? It's just gonna be buyer and seller. So, you know, they'll have to, 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 to work that out. And, um, you know, buyer can use a letter or whatever they need to use to, to send along with attachments to to provide that. Uh, so that is how that piece uh, that piece works. And then the um, any questions on up to this point before we keep going? Anything on deposits? All right. Um, so now we're starting to talk about obligations. Okay, and what are the seller's obligations while they're remaining in the property? Um, and a lot of these um, sort of mirror things from the sale agreement. And, and most of these I think should make a lot of sense to you is why we're requiring them. Uh, but seller shall comply with all laws, covenants, conditions, restrictions related to the property, and not interfere with any legal rights of use held by others. So if this, if there's an easement, Okay, they can't interfere with that. If this was like um, some kind of a tenants in common sale and they, they only purchased one, you know, portion of tenant in common interest, you know, they can't interfere with the other tenant in common interest. Uh, they cannot engage in any unlawful activities. They can't interfere with uh, the peaceful enjoyment of others' properties nearby. Um, they can't do dangerous activities, store dangerous products. Um, that would be likely to cause damage to the property. They cannot um, make any alterations without written, you know, express written consent of buyer. They can't do anything that would cause a lien to the property, okay? Um, unless that was already, you know, agreed to. If there was an agreement that seller was going to, you know, do some repairs or something during that period of time and had to hire a contractor to do that but they can't just go and do that without the written permission of buyer. And they're gonna indemnify buyer from that and any reasonable costs and attorney fees associated with removal of said lien. So if they do do something uh, where it requires a contractor and a contractor would have the right to lien the property um, and a lien does arise, the seller is going to be responsible for uh, removal of that as well as the attorney fees and costs. Um, you have to maintain those smoke and carbon monoxide detectors that we had already checked to make sure they were there during the sale agreement. And then uh, property conditions. So we talked about this before. We really tried to just carry forward the obligation of the seller related to the property condition because we think we have a pretty clean uh, section in the base sale agreement about <clears throat> how the buyer need, seller needs to deliver the property to the buyer. And we saw no reason to really veer too far from what we already are requiring. Whether it's closing and possession date are the same date or whether possession date is some point after the closing date, the seller is gonna be the one who's had exclusive possession of the property for that period of time. So we didn't really think it should be any different standard in terms of how they deliver the property. So we say that the terms of the closing possession property condition and cleaning section, which is in the base sale agreement, they carry forward. And that includes the, a requirement that seller deliver the property and all of its components in substantially the condition, same condition as when buyer submitted buyer's offer to purchase. Okay, buyer made their offer based on a particular condition of the property. The seller's got to keep it in that condition when they deliver it to the buyer, whether that delivery is at closing or after closing. Um, that also, uh, we also spell out in more detail sort of the maintenance obligations of the seller. And those really do uh, in large part, continue to fall on the seller. So they have to maintain the property during the, their occupancy term. They have the duty to repair or replace. Okay, so I know that 
in an, uh, the other agreement that you're used to using, there's some distinctions between repair and replace and whose responsibility it is. We didn't wanna do that. We wanted to keep it clean. Seller's got the duty to repair or replace any system or appliance that becomes inoperative or malfunctions prior to possession. But we do have a couple of exceptions, okay? So in the sale agreement, the parties are going to indicate whether there's a home warranty. If there is a home warranty that covers that system or appliance, then of course, we want that home warranty to cover uh, the issue here. We, you know, the warranty's already been purchased. It was purchased to replace or repair that particular item. And so we should take advantage of it, not require the seller to separately pay out of pocket for that. Um, however, if there's any deductible or service fee, the seller would have to pay because generally speaking, we are putting obligations here on the seller. Okay. The other exception is going to be if there was damage to the property that's covered by Briar's property and casualty insurance. You know, the reason why buyer is purchasing property and casualty insurance is to cover you know, those bigger ticket items that could happen th through no fault of buyer or seller tree falls on the house, whatever it might be. And so, um, and we have an insurance provision later in the contract, but we want the insurance to pay for that, okay? However, we know that there can be impacts. I mean, one, there's gonna be a deductible. Two, you know, it could impact rates for that buyer's insurance policy going forward. So if the damage was the result of negligent, reckless, or willful conduct of the seller, it wasn't a tree falling on the house, but it was something that the seller uh, did that they shouldn't have done, then the seller is going to have to pay any deductible associated with buyer's property and casualty insurance claim. Okay. But if it was an accident, uh, you know, if it was a tree, a natural disaster, it's not, seller's not going to have to pay that deductible. Okay. Um, and so we do, we note here, it's important to go back to that sale agreement and review the section on property condition cleaning. And if you recall, uh, there's some other provisions in there in addition to the seller having to deliver the property in the same condition when as when buyer made offer. For example, the provision that any personal property that was not part of the sale agreement, that if it's left after possession, then the seller is going to have no more rights in that property. And the buyer could dispose of that property or keep it. Uh, if they do dispose of it and they have any costs associated with that disposal, then the buyer is going to have a right of action against the seller to recover those costs. Okay, so that's part of that section of our sale agreement that we're carrying forward here. So the parties really should make sure they go back and review that piece. Um, so now we're going to talk about the remedies for the buyer, okay, uh, and particularly the right to evict. So talking here about if the seller breaches the contract or if the seller fails to vacate. Okay, so if they fail to vacate by the end of the term, or otherwise, okay, they're in default under this agreement. And again, we're not requiring the notice of default. So if they're breaching a material term of this agreement, then they're going to be um, in default. They may file an eviction, the buyer may file an eviction action with the court pursuant to ORS 105, uh, ORS chapter 105. Okay, so that those are the typical uh, provisions of the eviction laws uh, that describe how a landlord would evict a tenant. And even though it isn't a landlord tenant relationship, the eviction process, even though it's turned out to kind of be a lot messier and more difficult than it used to be, it's actually designed to sort of be an expedited process that, uh, you know, at least in theory is supposed to be seen as a benefit to landlords. And so here the buyer is going to have the benefit of that expedited process to get out the seller rather than having to go file a full claim in, in civil court and go through all the timelines that it would take to do that. Okay. So it's a, there's shorter turnaround times. There's forms online for doing it. The Oregon courts have a form for um, filing for an eviction. There's a checkbox on the form where one of the reasons that you're filing the eviction is because it is a, a seller who is occupying after closing. Uh, for less than 90 days. Um, so it's a pretty easy, straightforward process uh, there. However, of course, you all shouldn't be advising on that. If there, it's going to be an eviction, the, the client should work with an attorney on that. Um, and I, now just to, to note, we say, I mentioned, you know, we don't use the notice of default provisions. Um, uh, however, as we've told you with all of our 
you know, contracts. The reason why we did the notice of default provisions is because it's always going to be a cleaner case for a buyer who's bringing an action for breach of contract against a seller uh, here if they have notified them in advance that 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 they're not in compliance with the contract and given them an opportunity to cure. So even though we don't include that, if, for example, part of the agreement here was that seller is going to mow the lawn and seller hadn't mowed the lawn and buyer's trying to figure out what to do, buyer would still be wise to send a notice to seller saying, seller, you said in the agreement to occupy after close, you were going to mow the lawn. Will you please mow the lawn? Because I don't want to have to evict you from this property, okay? So it's still advisable for them to do that, but we don't re require that as part of this. Um, and then we also say here that, um, and this is significant, sellers need to understand this before they enter into this agreement, that sellers are going to be liable for twice the actual damages suffered by buyer as a result of a failure to vacate, plus all reasonable attorney fees, costs, and expenses associated with pursuing an eviction. Okay, So those that could be significant costs to seller. So they really need to be out when they say they're going to be out. Okay. Um, and, and there's a huge risk to them in, 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 in not doing so. Uh, we just remind folks, even though you can use the eviction process, we're not creating a landlord tenant relationship. And then anything other than eviction, any other dispute is going to follow the terms of the sale agreement in terms of dispute resolution, which is going to be $10,000 or less small claims court, more than $10,000 or any other act, action other than eviction that's not monetary dispute, that would be mediation and arbitration. And again, we mentioned here, the curable default provisions of the sale agreement do not apply. Early vacancy. So this one was a little tricky to figure out the right way to land on this. I, th I think we, we came up with it. So what if seller leaves early? You know, what are the rights and responsibilities? Well, we say that seller must provide at least 24 hours notice if they intend to vacate prior to the end of the occupancy term. But even if they provide notice, that's not an agreement, that's just notice, okay? Even if they provide a notice, unless there's an agreement, okay? So there's something between buyer and seller in writing agreeing to this, seller's still going to remain obligated under the terms of this occupancy agreement, okay? Both for the money, you know, for the amount that they paid for the occupants, full occupancy term, but also for the property maintenance and insurance obligations, okay? So um, they, if they say, hey, I'm out, I'm leaving early, they still have to go maintain that property and they still have to keep that insurance. Now, if a buyer were to receive that notice from seller, it's probably, a, maybe it's advisable for buyer to say, hey, I don't, I don't trust that seller. They're not even gonna be there. Why don't we agree in writing? Okay, that we're going to end this early. Uh, so that still probably would be the advisable approach, but we wanted to make sure that we did not let a seller believe that they could just leave early and because they're no longer living there, their obligations to maintain the property are no longer there because you could imagine a situation where there's a period of time where nobody's keeping an eye on the property because seller left early and maybe buyer didn't even know that. Should buyer also wait until the end of the occupancy term of of the term to occupy? Yeah, so that's so that again, if the if they don't agree in writing to amend this agreement, okay, then the buyer should wait. But but what I would advise is if you if you're a buyer receiving a notice from a seller saying I'm leaving early, um, and in that instance the seller already knows they they have no right to refund because that's part of the contract here it probably makes sense for buyer to say, okay, well, let's just agree in writing then that we're gonna end this thing and I'm gonna, I'm gonna move in now, okay? Um, so again, it's a choice uh, for the buyer, but they wouldn't want, um, you know, they'd wanna work that out in writing so there's no misunderstanding about who had a right to occupy the property. Okay. Um, in terms of injury to other persons or property, it's going to be seller that is solely liable, okay, um, from any liability for injury to person or property resulting from activities taking place at the property. Uh, 
as well as any damage to the real or personal property of others that results from seller's use of the property. So if they have people over, um, you know, there's a slip and fall, uh, we're saying here that the seller is going to be uh, the one responsible for that. They're going to indemnify and hold harmless the buyer and the buyer's representatives and employees, um, agents from any claim suits, judgments relating um, to that issue. Okay. So they're an ongoing theme of this agreement is we put a lot on the seller. Almost all of the responsibilities that they had when they still own the property are carrying forward during this occupancy term until they deliver the possession of the property. Um, and that includes the requirement for the indemnification on the seller to pay all reasonable attorney's fees, costs, and expenses um, if there were a claim that were brought against buyer or one of buyer's agents um, for something that happened uh, uh, related to injury to personal property while the seller was still living there. Now, in order to effectuate these provisions, we need to have strong insurance provisions, okay? Because if you really want <clears throat> the seller to be able to, to pay for those types of damages or you know liabilities, they are gonna need to be insured. So we start with renter's insurance. Um, and we have the pre-printed number here, a million dollars, okay? That would be liability coverage that goes along with the renter's insurance. Now we don't care what the renter insurance terms are as it relates to the renter's personal property, okay? Um, they, they can choose, but as it relates to liability, Okay. And we just talked about the early, the, the section 12, where the seller is going to be responsible for liability for damage to personal and property. They need to have a lot of insurance. We've heard from people, um, and we heard this a lot when, before our forms came out and just talking about the ORF agreement, that for some reason, people have a hard time finding an a million, a million dollar add-on liability coverage with a renter's policy. I don't know why that's the case. I've talked to many insurance companies. I know all of the large insurance companies will provide that. Um, I know one insurance agent I called and I asked about this and they wrote up a, a sort of mock policy for me in two minutes and sent it over to me and it was very inexpensive. So I don't know why people are having problems with this. Um, I'd say look further. If your first agent says we don't do that, like look further because if you call State Farm or Allstate or those companies, they will do it. Um, so we did give the option to pick a lower amount, okay, if for some reason that's what the parties want. But if I were a buyer entering this agreement, I would want the million dollar. Um, and if I were a seller, I would want that too, because I'm responsible for all of this up here in section 12. Okay. Um, let's see. The, honestly, it was like 12, 12 bucks or something, maybe like. Because it's it's such a short period of time, typically the amount is almost negligible. Um, now that we think that might be why folks are having trouble finding it, because it's for such a short period of time, and the value of the policy is so low that, um, in in terms of what's being paid to the insurance company in premium, that it, maybe some insurance agents just don't think it's worth their time, and they don't want to do this. And so they sort of default to saying, well, we don't do that, okay? But it is available, it's super easy and it's not at all expensive. <clears throat> now we say that they should list the buyer as additional named insured or additional named interest, okay? The additional named insured is going to be, um, mean that the buyer could also bring a claim under the seller's policy. Yeah, the additional name interest means that the buyer is at least going to be notified when claims uh, arise. Okay, the main thing we want here is the seller <clears throat> to have that policy because they're the ones that are going to be liable and need to indemnify the buyer. Um, but if you can, uh, again, we've heard people say, well, we can't find it with additional named insured, they'll only do additional named interest. So we've put both options on here. Um, but uh, in terms of understanding the difference between those things, you know, the clients should talk with their own insurance agents to, to understand. We put the flexibility in here only because we have heard that people are having barriers to that. Um, 
So then we say that uh, the proof of insurance needs to be provided two business days or whatever number of days you put before closing. Okay, we wanted to do it before closing so that, uh, you know, that we're not waiting until we're at the closing table to understand if this obligation has been met. Uh, we we want to see it before closing and that would then give the buyer um, the opportunity to not go forward with the contract if um, the seller had not provided that yet. Okay, we don't want to be have situations where buyers at the closing table, they're only then learning that the insurance wasn't purchased and now they're freaking out and trying to figure out what to do and if they still want to go forward. So that's why we want it to happen before closing. Um, then uh, we also have insurance obligations on buyer. Okay, they need to get property casualty insurance. We talked earlier about if it's a casualty issue, then the buyer's insurance is going to pay for it. Um, <clears throat> so they need to do that at least at the replacement value, cost value of the property. Uh, other than that, we're really not detailing the buyer's insurance policy. Okay, the buyer, you know, buyers have a lot of options when they purchase a home on the details of their insurance policy. Obviously, it needs to be sufficient for their lender. Um, but for our purposes, we want to make sure at least covers the replacement value of the property. It's likely that there, uh, or there could be other insurance coverages that the parties would want to have after talking with their insurance agents um, about this agreement. So we encourage them to do that. Um, you know, if I, what I would recommend is that <clears throat> if there are folks who are, you know, contemplating this agreement, they bring a copy of it. Uh, over to their insurance agent or send a copy to their insurance agent, have a discussion about making sure that they have these required coverages up here, but also a discussion about any additional coverages that could be protective of their interest. Um, and you all should really not be the ones doing that. Refer them to an insurance agent if they don't have one, um, but don't try to play insurance agent. In terms of utilities, again, in similar fashion to the rest of this agreement, the seller is going to be responsible for paying those on time. Um, and they're also going to be responsible for the replacement cost of any fuel that was consumed during the occupancy term, uh, <clears throat> you know, home home heating fuel and the like. We do say that it survives the death of the parties, okay? Meaning that um, the fact, like, if the seller died, um, which would be a terrible circumstance, of course. Um, you know, there still needs to be, their state's still going to be obligated to maintain the property for that period of time uh, that remains. And, you know, there should be communication between the um, representative of the estate and the buyer to work out any things, including, hey, we're going to end this thing early, but it just doesn't happen automatically. You, there still needs to be that, um, that communication that occurs. Dispute resolution we talked about, it's going to be the base sale agreement. So we're going to be uh, small claims, 10,000 or under, or mediation or arbitration if over, except for the evictions where we're going to go to the circuit court and use the, the eviction process. Um, I think this is probably duplicative. I think we said this earlier, but the seller cannot create any encumbrances on the property. Okay. So we already talked about liens, but they can't uh, agree to any other. Um, you know, easements or licenses to use the property or other things um, during their occupancy term, okay? unless the buyer was agreeing to that writing. No waiver, this is in our base sale agreement as well, meaning, um, <clears throat> you know, let's say, let's say the, the, I, the example I used earlier about the lawn mowing, they put in the additional provisions here that the seller's got to mow the lawn, Buyer drives by, sees that the lawn wasn't mowed, but says, hey, you know, I'm not going to say anything about it. Um, and then later the buyer wants to <clears throat> say, you know, call out the uh, the lawn mowing and tell the seller, hey, you need to do this lawn mowing. Um, the seller can't say, well, no, you knew that I wasn't mowing the lawn. You've already agreed that I wasn't going to mow the lawn because you saw it. You didn't say anything. So that's not part of our contract anymore. They can't do that. The buyer can call that out uh, at any point. And the fact that Maybe um, the buyer let something slip by, does not impact any other rights the buyer has to pursue a, a, a breach of the contract. And then, um, of course, just like sale agreement, anything needs to be in writing, signed by both parties if they're going to amend this. And this is where we have that provision about the uh, buyers and sellers agents and their firms and employees having no role in this agreement. 
post-closing. And I would recommend that you all have an office policy and a policy for your practice that sticks cleanly to that. Because we can say it in the agreement, but if you start playing that role, there, you're going to create the expectation of that. And the parties are going to keep relying on you. They're going to start asking you questions about, hey, I think that the other side maybe is breaching their occupancy agreement. What do you think? Okay, well, That's not a question that you want to have to answer. I know that you want to continue to take care of your clients and you feel an obligation to do so. Um, but at least in my opinion, in my opinion, and that's why we drafted the agreement this way, it's not really your role. Once closing has occurred, leave it to the parties to deal with their issues. Patrick, if buyer and seller want to change their agreement after closing, can they just, you can just about bet they're going to talk to agents regarding how to do it. How should we respond? That's a great question, Patrick. And yeah, I think they would. Um, I, but I think, you know, an answer that you can provide is, hey, the contract says that I'm no longer involved. We're going to respect that contract and let you, uh, buyer and, and seller, figure it out. And, um, you know, really, they don't need to use, you know, these standard forms are here to help, but they don't need to use them. I mean, people enter contracts and modify them all the time, you know, just by writing them up. So it's not a big deal for them to modify this contract by just writing up a document that the two of them sign. Okay. So I don't think that you um, really need to, you just tell them, Hey, the contract says, no, it's not that it's going to be between the two of you. I want, want to respect the contract. Um, if you need advice on how to modify the agreement, you need to talk to an attorney. Um, but, you know, I think you, you could also tell them, you know, they don't, they aren't like obligated to continue to use this particular form. Okay. So they could, um, they could do that. Uh, you know, you, I suppose, I mean, I have to think more about this and they allowed me, I'm thinking like, would it make sense to, you know, give them some blank addendums or something to just have, um, you know, that makes me a little nervous because then it's going to look like you did it. So I think I would, I would avoid that, you know, so I would just, I would just point to the contract <clears throat> tell them if they need advice on what to write, they need to go work with someone, um, uh, to, to help them do that other than you, you know, someone, uh, with an attorney. And then let's see, um, additional, Oh, so then we do, oh yeah, exchange of keys. Okay, so we have a few options here. Okay, seller can deliver keys to buyer at the end of the occupancy term, so that'd be all the keys. Alternatively, seller could deliver one set of keys to buyer at closing, the remaining keys at the end of the occupancy term, <clears throat> or we have, and then we have room here for additional instructions, okay? So we recognize there are lots of different ways that people like to do this and use of lock boxes and other things. And so we just wanted to, um, give enough room here for the parties to spell out exactly what they want. We didn't feel like we could, with check boxes, get everything right. We're assuming that there's going to be additional instructions that are provided here in many cases. Um, we did include a release here um, <clears throat> saying that seller and buyer release and agree to indemnify and hold harmless their agents, brokers, um, you know, and, and employees from any claims arising from this agreement. So again, <clears throat> to you don't want to um, interfere with this protection that you have in this contract. And if you do start bucking around with, with the agreement post-closing, you might really be undermining your, your ability to enforce this provision here. And so <clears throat> another reason why you should really just try to avoid that. Additional provisions, uh, if, if needed, uh, you could use a general addendum for more space. Um, I believe in zip forms and in Skyslope, if you run out of space writing here on the additional provisions, it'll actually automatically populate one of those. Addendum. And then uh, signatures and dates. Okay, so that is the agreement. Um, we're at 10.55. Happy to stick around and answer any questions that people have. Um, Everyone's welcome to hop on our open house at 11 as well. All right.
All right, well, I'm not seeing any questions come in, so thanks everyone for your time. Appreciate it. Next week, we'll be doing the buyer occupancy agreement. Um, so the buyer moving in prior to closing, which I will tell you, I don't like, I like the document. Like, I think we did a good job with our document. I think the situation of a buyer moving in before closing uh, is an inherently risky situation, so I wouldn't encourage it. However, we do know sometimes you need to do it. So we have a form for that and we'll teach you how to use it next week. All right, thanks everybody.